Hello, how are you doing? This is Anne-Marie Fischer speaking. I would like to thank the wonderful Jairus board, Dr. Karatsas, for welcoming me to this year's 2021 conference. And I would also like to thank Neil, Dion, and Katerina, and especially Neil for taking on the double task to host this wonderful and inspiring panel. And on that note, I would like to give a special shout out to Dina and Lindsay for wonderful presentations that I had the honor to host. Just as a quick overview, I already sent you the circulars model that I worked on for my dissertation project that hopefully we can discuss afterwards and I hope you will find it inspiring. And I will just quickly share my project, describe the findings at my fieldwork at the United Nations at the Department of Public Information that is actually now the Department of Global Communications. If you have any questions, just let me know, give me a shout and I hope you will enjoy it. Thanks. So once again, welcome to my presentation. All human beings are equal, but why are some global issues more global and globally transmitted than others? The multilogue of human rights. So just as a quick backstory to my project, I served as an intern at the United Nations Department of Public Information, and I attended a lecture by Irene Khan from Amnesty International, hosted by Shashi Tharoor, the Undersecretary General of Public Information. And the talk was named The Danger of Human Rights. And we quickly shifted the discussion to discussing Darfur and how to raise awareness and why we have a plethora of information, but we don't act upon it. This is basically part of my dissertation that I realized at Binghamton University with my academic advisors, Professor Gisela Brinker Gabler, Professor Douglas Holmes, Professor Luisa Morera, Professor Jennifer Lundstöver, and Professor Jeremy Gerritz. When I was attending Binghamton University and the PhD program. I got inspired by the Department of Anthropology, exploring this project further with ethnographic research. But my pathway was comparative literature and global factual narratology. And just a quick note, I also wrote a blog about my experience. So here you can see the crystallized leitmotifs, guiding principles of my work. The guiding principles are women and or versus with machine. And this was inspired by Walter Benjamin's and Axel Brun's concept of the storyteller and the producer. The resource distribution, because the internet as an economic system reflects economic dimensions and relations. And the third leitmotif or guiding principle is that systems, terminologies merge and there is a hybridity of texts. I basically came up during my ethnographic research with the UN cyborg or the UN mimics, and probably you're familiar with Donna Haraway's concept of the cyborg as the woman machine and Vannevar Bush's concept of a global accessible library as a mimics. And my research concentrated on three realms, the communication goal and infrastructure of the United Nations as the internal realm, the external communi communication network, and the communication ideal that I described here as the cyborg mimics of global communications. Is someone who specialized, of course, in social media, who is fluent in the six UN languages, is able to simultaneously translate content, is able to work 24 seven across time zones and is familiar with UN protocol. And my research concentrated on three realms the communication goal and infrastructure of the United Nations as the internal realm, the external communication network, and the communication ideal that I described here as the cyborg mimics of global communications. Based on my fieldwork at the United Nations headquarters in New York, I conceptualized this ideal type of the UN storyteller. The model also reflects the political impetus communicative ideals and rules of conduct of the UN. All work is a collaborative process geared towards reaching a consensus. All individual utterances should reflect the voice and founding principles of the organization in all six official UN languages, included and represented equally. And all internal and external activities must follow special procedures and meet protocol, unattainable by one single human being alone, only by a community network embedded in an organization. Following protocol and conduct by experienced diplomats, this way of communicating enabled a pathway of communication amongst political antagonists, literally bringing them to sit at one table. Those rules and procedures were not viewed as restrictive for communication. Instead, 
The protocol was regarded as suited to managing and making the organization work and to ensuring the continuity and the common voice within the complex organizational infrastructure of the UN system, the UN headquarters, and the agencies around the world. Based on my fieldwork at the United Nations headquarters in New York, I conceptualized this ideal type of the UN storyteller. The model also reflects the political impetus, communicative ideals, and rules of conduct of the United Nations. All work is a collaborative process geared towards reaching a consensus. All individual utterances should reflect the voice and founding principles of the organization in all six official UN languages, included and represented equally. And all internal and external activities within the UN must follow special procedures and meet protocol, unattainable by one single human being alone, only by a community network embedded in an organization. Following protocol and conduct by experienced diplomats, this way of communicating enables a pathway of communication amongst political antagonists, literally bringing them to sit at one table. Those rules and procedures were not viewed as restrictive for communication. Instead, the protocol was regarded as suited to managing and making the organization work and to ensuring continuity and a common voice within the complex organizational structure, the UN system, the UN headquarters, and UN agencies around the world. Basically, my work shifts between the dichotomy of the virtue and the value of the human. And what you can see here is the virtue of the human, represented in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Article 19. I quote, Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. The premier canon for human rights is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This most universal document in the world is the most translated global text, currently reaching 525 language communities, which the founder of the internet, Tim Berners-Lee, regards as a sign of hope for human cooperation. Regarding the hierarchical position, however, research and global access to information, expression and distribution of one's opinion are part of the Universal Declaration in Article 19 and part of the Millennium Development Goals, but inside the MDGs, it's not a primary goal. I actually contrast this virtue with the value of the human. This is an example that is actually still taught in journalism, and I'm a trained journalist, and I quote from Jaap van Ginneken's Understanding Global News. The rule is 10,000 deaths on another continent equal 1,000 deaths in another country equal 100 deaths in an outpost equal 10 deaths in the center of the capital equal the death of a celebrity. There are six official languages at the UN, Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. English and French are the two linguae francae. And while the official languages present and represent geographical diversity, there is also a qualitative hegemonic moment in time. The staff selection process attempts to mirror the global community and meet the ideal of diversity that nations are neither underrepresented nor overrepresented. On the other hand, this virtue becomes a value and a burden. While a global communication strategy restricted to the English language would not be sufficient to fulfill the UN ideals of diversity and multilingualism, the usage of English proves to be the most economically efficient path, even though it comes at the price of not reaching everybody, notably those on the periphery. And of course, this reflects the leitmotif of center versus periphery and virtue versus value. As it is most natural to communicate in one's native language tongue, part of the global audience might hesitate or even refrain from communicating experiences and specifically referring to Katerina's presentation, notably trauma. So what you can see here is a visualization of the digital divide that is reconceptualized by Pipa Norris as information poverty. And I actually think that this is a more apt term because digital divide reduces it to the geographical, but I think information poverty captures the resource inequalities that needs to be resolved. Tim Berners-Lee, the founder of the internet, addresses in a 2019 30 year anniversary podcast, the, and I quote, dysfunction in the setup of the system, the vulnerability to manipulative attacks and the tendency to, I quote, commercially reward clickbait 
and the viral spread of misinformation, end of quote, resulting in a, I quote, outraged and polarized tone, end of quote. The basic setup of the system records any activity, positive or negative, as data points to adjust accordingly and thus rewards controversial but traffic generating narratives. Algorithms not only reflect but also condition, reinforce and weaken our reflexes, our mind, for the sake of maintenance of one's own sanity, in turn numbs these reflexes as compassion fatigue that Catherine actually mentioned in her presentation. Basically, uh, compassion fatigue is a term from nursing sciences and describes the paradox of caring and not caring, of caring too much and then turning down the response that we have towards disturbing information. In this GRIS presentation, I challenged the global of the global. The typical internet user is a young Western male. We literally get to hear and see only half of the story. The term digital divide is a spatial metaphor, but it not only describes a spatial geographical border, but also reflects social and economic boundaries in access to technology in social status and economic income. Lacking the information resource, and being left out of the information discourse. A shortage of access and therefore a lack of information is an inherent trait of globalization, not just as a trait of the other, but as a trait of us, capitalized. There are degrees of global accessibility. The political framework ensuring prohibiting availability of access to information, online literacy and education, language proficiency that I just described with English, the speed of internet access, provision of unlimited, unrestricted data volume, the availability of a technological apparatus, available free time, and last but not least, economic resources. So what you can see here is the structure of the United Nations Information Center networks, the UNIX, as you can see with the yellow dots, a geographical leitmotif that I encountered during my research and during my field work is the importance of the field and the voices from the periphery, both as a staff experience and as a source and resource for first-hand accounts to publish and broadcast. And the staff was, and I quote, desperate for field content. And those stories were worth more than anything an expert can tell you, end of quote. The mission to connect locally, locally and globally, is illustrated with the strategic communication system of 63 United Nations Information Centers and Services, UNIX and UNICES, worldwide at the UN Strategic Communications Division. At the time of my internship, many offices in the Western European nations have been replaced with cross-national intermediary hubs in lieu of national representations to balance the resource distribution towards the periphery. Thus, the structure of these offices has been changed regionally, nearing reverse resource distributions of Emmanuel Wallerstein's world system analysis with a core, semi-periphery and periphery. So there's a counterbalancing of the UN resources towards the periphery and the centralization of the core. This is also reflected in a quote I pulled from Walter Lippmann's Public Opinion, that is another seminal work published in 1922. The size of a woman's income has considerable effect on her or his access to the world beyond her or his neighborhood. The income of the individual and the income of the community determine the amount of communication that is possible. What you can see here is Spivak's concept of rumor that describes the global communication flow. If then, rumor is spoken utterance par excellence, it must be seen that its functional immediacy is its non-belonging to any one voice consciousness. This would be a characteristic of writing. Any reader can fill it with her consciousness. Rumor evokes comradeship or community, as I refer to it, because it belongs to every reader or transmitter. No one is its origin or source. Thus, rumor is not error, but primordially originally errant, always in circulation, with no assignable resource. This illegitimacy makes it accessible to insurgency. And I would also like to stress that rumor can be either factual or fictional. According to Spivak, rumor exerts an invisible insider power their soft, speculative, circular, and communal nature challenges to end disrupts the hard fact authorial rule. Contrasted, however, to the cyber cult and culture of rumors, one common denominator of UN communications is an aversion toward rumors. Under no circumstances is the UN to become the distributor of rumors within the global community. The pivotal role of trust was stated, and I quote, 
If we act on rumors, people lose confidence in us. We have to make sure the information we put out is confirmed. This aversion to the spreading of unconfirmed rumors and short-term sensationalism contrasts with the security and the validating of information, and thus results in the slower pace of the UN, and I quote, if one were to seek fast info, there are other paths. UN utterances might not even be recorded in the global consciousness as they occur outside of the fast-paid discourse of the internet. The virtue of confidence, respect, and relevance of and for the UN are regarded higher in the UN value system. What is also notable is the relationship between the verbal and the numerical and the need to balance the abundance of statistics, facts, and figures with a personal and personalized angle, and to provide positive stories, which connects to Harkops and O'Neill's updated evaluation and the good news value added to the news value paradigm. And I quote, people and reporters lack figures and numbers and statistics, but at the same time, we need to humanize it to get the story across. My work covers and explores the blank spaces in the global narrative fabric. What is not yet out there, it is about what one does, but also about what one does not do, what doesn't get to do due to resource distributions. One paradigm setting and paradigm shifting piece that you can see here of my work is Gerald Prince's seminal essay that is narrated on these passive narratives and the un- and non-narratables. Prince conceptualizes these literally uneventful topics with inherent taboos and intrinsic lack of a narrator, missing a compelling narrative structure and defines the category of unnarratable or non-narratable as that which, according to a given narrative, cannot be narrated or is not worth narrating because it transgresses a law, social, authorial, genetic formal, or because it defies the power of a specific narrator or those of any narrator, or because it falls under the so-called threshold of narrativity. It is not sufficiently unusual or problematic. So what you can see here is an excerpt of the UN calendar. And I filtered the UN calendar, there are much, much, much more, the days that are commemorating or celebrating a specific topic or issue, according to Article 19. As you can see here, there are certain days addressing a certain medium or a certain genre, as the World Radio Day, the Poetry Day, the Philosophy Day, also addressing the media and translation professions, notably the World Press Freedom Day and the International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. But quite recently, there have been days added to ensure the universal access to information and the World Development Information Day. And what is also quite notable is that the only day dedicated to statistics, the numerical dimension, is the only day celebrated every five years. And the last one actually happened last year and was commemorating the trustworthiness of resources, interestingly. So to conclude, I would like actually to refer to literature and the text I came across as a translator for the Around the World in 80 Days book blog, Professor Dambrosch from the Institute for World Literature. Olga Tukarczuk, who is a Nobel laureate, the tender narrator. Literature is built on tenderness toward any beings other than ourselves. It is the basic psychological mechanism of the novel. Thanks to this miraculous tool, the most sophisticated means of human communication, our experience can travel through time, reaching those who have not yet been born, but who will one day turn to what we have written, the stories we told about ourselves and our world. So to go back to the United Nations, one interviewee defined the successful communication goal as, and I quote, when people know what the UN is doing, there is a lack of widespread knowledge about the UN structure and its decision-making process. The current climate of information, overload and confusion, conspiracy theorists and fake news demand a transnational and transgenerational pedagogy of not only of the UN, as in the Essential UN project, but to learn and to teach the global community where to look for data resources, which institutions to trust and explore for data, how to read and interpret data, how to understand the mechanics of cyberspace. Numeracy is seen as part of literacy by the UNESCO, and the UNESCO also published a pedagogy of fake news. Apart from the UN as a paradigm setter, the United Nations could play a role as a resource for global data, as a storyteller, and as a translator to fill in the blank spaces of the global narrative fabric, explain context information and complex information, serve as a collector, distributor, and instructor on global data, notably on its meta context, and ensure global access to the information framework. The cyber community, in turn, could not only contribute to the distribution of global issues, 
but also provide their own perspective from the periphery, while the United Nations seeks trustworthy storytellers in order to be trusted in a thorough trust process, cyberculture reconceptualizes anonymous authorship while the internet chooses fast-paced developing stories, the UN values the more time-consuming process of confirming information to development. Established virtues remain as firm values. Analysis have taught me to think about not only storytelling as the final narrative product, but also the story resourcing of raw materials and the story trusting of valid resources, specifically the lack of unfiltered raw information. What is striking is the stronger version against rumors. This section explored a possible actor to the United Nations situated between fundamental human rights of information and expression as a virtue in Article 19, diplomatic discourse, economic restraints, and the rapid free flow of information. The United Nations is a semi-permeable system a vast amount of information gets in. There are many voices to be heard, and in a procedural information processing and text editing process, one common voice gets out. The UN communication paths are closely guarded by procedures and protocol. There is a schedule and ritual to attend in every meeting. There are close communication guidelines for the staff. One interviewee summed up the core issue of global communications and the difficult environment on the periphery of global news. And I quote, the issues we work on are hard to get attention for. We are not the main headline. I would like to conclude my presentation with the circularism system that I developed for my dissertation that I sent out as the model and its terminology. And just as a quick footnote, the term circularism is actually a term used in drawing technique, and it describes the circular movements of the drawing tool to describe the surface of the human skin. So it reflects my leitmotif of woman versus machine. And what I found inspiring for this circularism system that I developed is not only the merging of user and producer and the texts by Spivak and Walter Benjamin, but also the fact that within this economic system of the internet, if you don't pay for the product, you are the product, as a really famous quote shows. There are systems that develop within the system that are not economic by nature, meaning that you as a user are not paid for your work of accessing the internet and providing data that in turn is readapting the system. So there's always this exchange between non-monetary and monetary frameworks in the economic system. There's an exchange of redistribution, reappropriation, as an externalization and internalization. And here you can see that I played around with circularism as a core stem. So circularism is the distribution of circulists of texts that are referred to them that are written and rewritten by the circular and circulars. What happens when you redistribute is you become the circular. So there is a merging of those functionalities and that makes it hard to trace fake news, for example. Based on Wallerstein's you have in the core, you have a permeability and an active flow as a circulist value and a high degree of distribution. But here with the border, you have a semi-permeability and an impermeability of information in the sense that those who are left out of the discourse lack the resource and vice versa. So this is the main reason why it's not transmitted and uncirculated. And I would also like to stress that this lack isn't only a lack occurring in the periphery, but also in the center because we also don't know what is happening in the periphery. And to conclude, the power hierarchy between center and periphery results in a permeability and or permeability or impermeability of the information flow and the information imbalance. The poorer, less resourceful countries receive an abundance of information from the richer parts of the world. However, the richer reasons remain also informationally impoverished about poorer regions as well. The global communication system skews towards the more resourceful and powerful parts. This adaptation of George Orwell's quote inspired my basic research question. All citizens are global, but some citizens are able to be more global than others because some citizens are more globally resourceful than others. It is vital to give the local on the periphery what it deserves a space and a place, a voice and a perspective in and into the center, which is painfully missing and lacking on both sides. The global dilemma is how to tell stories and generate resources within an economic system without adhering to economic messaging. So I would like to thank you so much for being in my presentation and I'm really looking forward to this discussion and I wrote down thank you in my mother tongue, German, Dankeschön, Dankscher in Bavarian and the six other UN languages. 
Thank you, merci, gracias, merci pour here, here, and. Thank you.